gonna wait another 30 seconds for everybody to get in and get their devices set up. Yes. Yeah, there's a lot of people. Yes. Great. Okay, I think we will start. Welcome to today's webinar. Um, this is put on by the Danish Sound Cluster, and we have been put in place here to strengthen the audio and sound uh, industry in Denmark. Although we have quite a lot of uh, members and attendees who are not located in Denmark, I can see. Um, today we have three very brilliant and different speakers um, who are going to speak about VR and audio, oh, sorry, audio in VR applications. And uh, before we jump in, I will just go through some of the practical, practical things. We have a Q&A chat. So if you have any questions for our speakers, you can just write it in there and I will um, ask them. If you want to ask about something very complicated, we can unmute your microphone and you can explain uh, to them yourself might be beyond me <laughs> and we have another chat for comments and feedback um, and we will not use the raise hand function today because there are too many people so we might not see you um, this is being recorded so we're going to put this recording up on the website afterwards so feel free to share with your colleagues or others who might be interested we're also going to send you the uh, slides and some other relevant links um, as well as the contact information for our speakers. So you can reach out to them if there's anything you would wish to discuss further with them. Um, I think that's about it. So first of all, we are going to um, hear from Stefania. Stefania is, the, is a professor and head of the multisensory experience lab at Aalborg University in Copenhagen. Uh, she's also the president of various sound and music, music computing networks um, and the project leader for the Nordic Sound and Music Computing Network. Um, she's going to start us off with the, an overview of the different technologies and applications of interactive audio in VR. Yeah, thank, thank you, you very for much for being here. Uh, thank you for the invitation. I just wanted to make sure that uh, you can hear me and you can see the slides. Yes, we can. Yes, thank you very much. So thank you for the introduction, Shelley. Um, I'm a professor at Talbot University here in Copenhagen. And uh, I work in a lab which is called the Multisensory Experience Lab. And I will uh, talk to you about uh, uh, an overview uh, of the activities that we do in the field of immersive audio. And uh, since uh, I have like 25 minutes, I will just give you some quick uh, taste. And then uh, you're very welcome to uh, Contact me if you want to hear more, and I can send you the related papers about it. So just to give an idea of the dimensions of our lab, so um, we work uh, a lot on, uh, uh, so it, we are called, first of all, uh, multisensory experience lab, because uh, although we are focused on uh, uh, sound and music technologies, we have also, we have always been interested in looking at uh, uh, sound in combination with other modalities because obviously we live in a multisensorial world. So um, we want to understand how sound affects, for example, touch and vision and vice versa. And also we look at applications, for example, for visual impaired individual or hearing impaired individual. So how these immersive technologies can help also to uh, facilitate uh, the use of technologies in everyday life for individuals with needs. So uh, I will show you different examples related to some basic research that we've been doing and also some uh, applied research. And we are also interested in uh, uh, cultural applications, for example, collaborations with uh, the Danish Music Museum, but uh, I will not talk about that uh, today. So just to give an example of the application that I will show you, they are all based on uh, some uh, technological artifacts uh, that uh, we develop in the lab. 
and then uh, uh, user experience both tested in the lab and then with the different uh, uh, kind of user groups. And uh, in this talk, I will focus, obviously, as the seminar is about uh, our applications in uh, immersive technologies. So um, there is a little bit of a confusion regarding uh, immersive technologies. So just to explain you what I mean. First of all, do you know who is uh, that invented the term virtual reality? You can write it in the chat, but otherwise I can give you the answer. And the answer is uh, a guy called Jean Lanier, who has been working on virtual reality for uh, 30, 40 years now. And he also wrote a very nice book about uh, uh, different definitions of virtual reality. I will come back to him also a bit later in the talk because he also has many other interesting uh, ideas regarding interaction in virtual reality. Also, when was the first HMD design? I mean, many people, they still say, oh, we are, uh, VR is so new, is uh, such uh, emerging technologies, but it's really not the case. I mean, some people think that the virtual reality started uh, with this guy that, uh, you know, he created the first uh, Kickstarter with the Oculus. Uh, only uh, six years ago, but actually the first person who uh, worked with the head mounted display was uh, quite a while ago in 68. And uh, his name is Ivan Sutherland. And uh, I'm talking briefly about uh, a paper that he wrote, which is really a pioneer paper that shows uh, his vision of virtual reality at the time, but also where we are now. So he wrote a paper entitled The Ultimate Display where it talks about uh, a chair displayed in this place. Uh, it's a chair where you can actually sit on. There are some handcuffs that, that would be confining and the bullet displayed in such a room would be fatal. So with the appropriate programming, such a display can be the wonderland in which uh, Alice was uh, wandering. So this is just to give you an idea of uh, uh, where are we now and what was his vision at the time? So considering his vision right now, are we there yet? So as you know, visual displays, they are getting better and better, more and more ergonomic and cheaper. And this is one of the reasons why virtual reality is becoming quite popular in different domains. We are still far with haptic displays. So this is an example of haptic display, a phantom that is used to interact uh, with uh, uh, in virtual reality, there are many more, but uh, uh, the sense of touch is still not as developed uh, technologically as in the real war world, where we can uh, interact with all different objects with uh, our whole body, basically. What about auditory display, which is, uh, of course, the topic of this, uh, uh, this presentation? So those uh, are getting better and better, but uh, uh, it is uh, still uh, challenging to have uh, an auditory display in VR, which is uh, equivalent as the real world, right? We are getting better with that, but still, and we will see a nice presentation after this by Fino about how his company is uh, nicely addressing those topics. And so this is just to give you an idea, if you wanna read at all the different challenges. So these are the technological challenges that are implied in designing a full interactive immersive virtual reality sonic display. So of course you have the space, you have the human ears that are different. So do we need to personalize the simulation of what is called the HRTF or is it enough to have some general one? How do we simulate the person moving around the space? How does sound propagate in different environments? So there is really a lot of uh, technology that needs to be in place in order to have a natural and realistic sound environment. So just to give an example of our work with the immersive technologies, uh, I will show you some very early work and then some more recent one. We started working with immersive technologies back uh, in uh, 2002, so almost uh, 20 years ago, when at Holborg University in actually Holborg, there was a project, a European project called Benogo, which stands for B no go. And the idea was to simulate uh, uh, physical spaces in virtual reality. Nowadays, it's super easy to get a 360 camera 
and uh, a low cost monthly display and uh, uh, capture a space and reproduce it uh, in virtual reality. At the time, it was not that easy. So that's why the European Union supported this project. And the idea was uh, how to uh, feel present in a virtual space as you are in a real one. This project evolved to another one uh, that was called natural interactive walking, because when you are in a, a virtual space uh, and you walk around the space, uh, of course, you have different issues like the size of the lab, which is confined. And it's not like the real world that this is almost so you can walk forever. And also the surface uh, where you walk, uh, um, it, uh, it's really different, of course, in the real world, uh, if you walk uh, on uh, the beach or if you walk on a busy street. So how can we simulate this in virtual reality? And uh, in this case, we designed some custom-made interfaces with uh, some uh, actuators. So you could both hear the sound of different surfaces and also feel it. Our focus uh, is uh, on natural interactions. So uh, those shoes were trying to create a natural walking experience. However, most virtual reality interfaces, they are far from natural. So they are this traditional joystick. And actually the person that I mentioned before, Jaron Lanier, he also says that uh, musical instruments are the best user interface. And this is a very interesting statement because what he's saying is that maybe we can learn from the different ways in which we interact with musical instruments. So we can tap them, we can bow them, we can hit on them, we can blow on them. While with a joystick, we can just move them around. So can we learn from musical instrument to design also interfaces for virtual reality? And this is something that we find quite inspirational. And uh, um, I would like to talk to you this, about some more recent projects regarding sound in virtual reality. Uh, another project we did uh, with uh, also a uh, 360 movies uh, was a project in order to uh, help uh, autistic children to uh, face real world simulations, uh, real world uh, uh, sorry situations like uh, going to a concert using virtual reality. In this specific project, we were lucky to be able to record uh, the Ramachan actors. If you have a Danish children, you maybe you recognize them in the uh, Danish radio concert hall. And the idea is that the child was able to play virtual musical instruments together with these actors in a virtual reality environment. And uh, uh, we can show that by playing in virtual reality, then uh, you uh, can be easier exposed to the real world. So let me show you just uh, briefly. Uh, this should be experienced, of course, with the 360 display, Tom, but... What you're currently seeing is a prototype developed for using exposure therapy in virtual reality. Two people can be inside the virtual environment at the same time, for example, a teacher and a child. Here, they can play three different instruments together. So, uh, uh, as a continuation of this project, we had also the opportunity to record the Danish National Children Choir. So the idea now is instead of playing with the children, you can sing with them. And there are many studies that show that singing together in the real world helps prevent anxiety and uh, um, helps uh, 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 confronting also the real world. So we wanted to test if it was the case also in virtual reality. So this is the choir when it performs uh, the concert house, but uh, they created a special rehearsal session for us. So first they do the warm up, and I'm gonna show you the video where they, uh, so this is what uh, a child sees while uh, um, performing with the, the choir. So this is, if you're looking around with the display, you have the feeling that you are singing with them. And you can see in the little square in the bottom, some children that uh, are really uh, playing uh, 
and the singing and acting together with the choir while experiencing in virtual reality, not paying attention to the surrounding environment. <laughs> yeah, so you also. So, and um, this uh, um, um, using 360 videos have, of course, the advantage of visual fidelity. But there are many elements that are uh, lacking. Of course, you cannot navigate in the environment, you cannot uh, interact with the characters, and uh, um, you have uh, a different experience than a, a 3D simulation, obviously. So uh, in this project, uh, we wanted to investigate uh, uh, two things. So this part of the project uh, called Hear Me VR, uh, it was uh, a virtual reality simulation. In this case, uh, a 3D simulation, so not a 360 movie, of uh, how it feels uh, to be a child who has a cochlear implant. So we were simulating both uh, the uh, school environment and the playground. And as you can see here in the video, this is like a run through of the simulation. So you enter the environment and you can choose uh, uh, if you want to be in the playground or in the classroom. This is what you experience when you enter the h &D. So here you can actually go around uh, and listen uh, to the different uh, children, uh, see what's going on and so on. And then uh, uh, you can also choose uh, to go in the classroom. So how does it feel to be an hearing impaired child in a classroom situation? So this project was uh, to enhance uh, awareness for the parents of how their children feel in a classroom. But uh, now we have started a project uh, together with the Center of Hearing and Balance at uh, uh, the Riz Hospital and Decibel, which is an association for hearing impaired children. And this project is about uh, training the children themselves about uh, uh, everyday life sound using virtual reality. So the idea is that there are lots of studies that show that uh, training in virtual reality is very effective for different kinds of uh, uh, situations than to transfer those skills in the real world. So we are creating simulations uh, of different uh, everyday environments for the children so they can train uh, how is the sound perceived in this both closed space and open space environments in such a way that then uh, they can, uh, uh, once they have uh, their cochlear implant, they can train their uh, uh, mostly speech perception skills uh, and then hopefully this will transfer also to better perception skills in the real world. That of course has still to be seen because the project has just started. And uh, uh, then uh, one last uh, project I would like to mention to you because my time is almost uh, running up. So uh, I was talking about uh, uh, natural uh, interactions and how do you interact uh, with uh, uh, virtual reality. So um, in this project, uh, this project a collaboration together with uh, a GN Resound. And uh, the project uh, was about uh, uh, if you want to uh, participate. So for example, if you want to improve the quality of hearing devices uh, using virtual reality, and also if you want to uh, prototype how to interact with the uh, sound environments. So what is the best way, for example, if you are in a conversation, like in this case, uh, what is the best way to zoom on uh, different persons in this conversation in order to listen what is said? So in this case, we were testing different kinds of interaction techniques, both using uh, um, eye tracking because uh, as probably many of you know, uh, by when you use the, uh, uh, the Vi Pro h &D, it has also an embedded eye tracker. So we were testing if uh, uh, the interaction with, for example, pointing at the person you wanted to listen to or looking at the person you wanted to listen to, which one was the most natural and effective interaction 
to be also incorporated then in future design of hearing devices. So we were prototyping in virtual reality the a combination between interaction and different beam forming algorithms in such a way to be able to transfer this knowledge also to more natural interactions with hearing devices. And I'm going to talk uh, about the very last project uh, because then uh, Fino will talk much more about that. Uh, we had uh, this uh, uh, project uh, about simulating virtual concert halls. So here the issue was, uh, it's a collaboration together with uh, uh, Jesper Anderson, who is a professor at the Danish Academy of Music, and he's also a PhD student now with us. And uh, uh, the issue is that, of course, during uh, Corona time, it was not possible uh, for composers to access uh, the facility of the conservatory. So the idea was to recreate their ambisonic concert hall in a virtual reality environment so uh, composers could have access uh, to the uh, loop and uh, the sonic experience of uh, being virtually in that concert hall before transferring their composition to the real concert hall. So I give you briefly an idea of uh, how the simulation looks like. So this is the actual room. They have a very nice ambisonic system. And this is the virtual uh, reality simulation. In back of a reel, railroad yard in San Jose, I wandered desolate in front of the tank factory and sat on a bench near the... So as I said, we will hear much more about simulations from Finur. So. I, and my time is actually already running out. So I just wanted to uh, show you some books which are open access if you wanna read more about uh, sonic interactions and uh, virtual reality. And then I would like to thank uh, my collaborators and uh, especially the colleagues of the Multisensory Experience Lab. And uh, I'm ready to take questions if there are. Thank you, Stefania. Thank you. I, I have a couple of questions for you. Yeah, uh, one was, um, what is it about VR that would be better than a speech therapist training a child or uh, just a video? Uh, so um, the, the advantage is that uh, uh, you have compared to a video is that uh, uh, you are recreating uh, uh, sonically, uh, you are recreating creating an experience which is uh, more similar to the uh, real world in the sense that, uh, so the, basically, the, especially the children, they have uh, three challenges. One is uh, uh, the spatial awareness and then uh, uh, distinguishing sound from noise. Mm -hmm. So uh, when you watch a video, uh, you are missing, uh, uh, you might have 3D sound, for example, with headphones or speaker, whatever, and then you can have the spatial sonic uh, 3D awareness, but you are missing the visual 3D awareness. And there are lots of studies uh, on audiovisual integration where they show uh, the importance of uh, also um, having a, a 3D sound combined with also 3D images. You can still have the ventriloquism effect, so which is like when you uh, combine sound with images. Mm -hmm. So it's still better having a 3D sound with a video than 3D sound with no video because then you are missing all the visual cues. But uh, with the virtual reality, you are creating a, a more uh, realistic environment, let's say, less realistic simulation of how it feels to be in the real world. Also, if you want to, uh, obviously, if you want to navigate, you cannot do that uh, in a screen. I mean, if you no. want to simulate the uh, 
the sensation of going around and listening and so on. It's of course. Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks for your answer. We have uh, someone in the chat here. Are you incorporating, this is from Tim Bishop. Are you mm -hmm. incorporating personalized HRTFs? Did you use a specially adapted HRTF for child listeners in VR projects? Okay, so um, in the, we had a postdoc that was working with a personalized HRTF for virtual reality, but we still don't have an answer if and when they are needed. Because there are some studies that show that uh, in virtual reality, they are not needed because uh, there are the visual cues or the motion cues and many other cues that can compensate. On the other hand, other studies show that they are important. So there's not, a, I guess it depends on the context. And now with the children singing, we were just using a generalized HRTF. All right. Hope that answers your question, Tim. We have a thanks. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you very much, Stefania. Let's move on to Finno. Thank you. Are you ready, Finno? I'm ready. You're ready? <clears throat> Finno is the founder and CEO of Treble Technologies and they are uh, creating the next generation of acoustic simulation, which enables designers to create a better sounding world, which is a pretty great goal to have. Um, and he is gonna speak to us about their work today and also some collaboration with uh, Henning Larsen. Great. So whenever you're ready, you can share your screen. Thank you. Thanks for being here. My pleasure. It's great to be with you all here today. Uh, thanks for the nice introduction. Uh, yeah, so as Shelley kind of said, we, we in Treble, we are developing new technology for, for architects and engineers and other people in the building industry to, to better work with sound and have sound become a more integral part of building design and, <clears throat> and sort of enable people to understand sound and de design for sound in a more intuitive and, and, and better way. And today I wanna just tell you a little bit about this technology that we're developing. We could call it virtual acoustics um, and show you a couple of examples of it in action. Um, so the agenda of my talk is first, I wanna talk just a bit generally about sound in the built environment and how sound and acoustics and noise influence us uh, influence our health and well-being and so on and hopefully by the end of that you will agree with me that uh, sound is important uh, and has a big influence on us and we should think about it when we design our built environment and probably do a little bit better than what we're doing now then move on to virtual acoustics the technical part of the talk and then end with a couple of demos uh, exactly some case studies we did together with Henning Larsen Architects before I start, just briefly about myself, I'm currently leading uh, this company, Treble Technologies. We're not a very old company, but uh, we're around 10 people working on this developing next generation sound simulation technology. But our roots go back quite a few years and go back into the academic world, including my own PhD research, where we were developing the sort of technological foundation that we in Treble are then taking further now. Before I did my PhD, I was an acoustic consultant in the building industry for a few years as well and did some software engineering too. And I just wrote here for fun some of my main sort of fields of interest and kind of the combination of all these things is virtual acoustics essentially. All right, but uh, first talk a little bit about sound in the built environment. So there has been a ton of research done throughout the years that shows the very clearly and unequivocally that sound has a major influence on our health and well-being and productivity. For example, in modern office buildings, uh, open plan offices, one survey after another is showing that something like 70% of people are unhappy about their sound environments and noise and poor acoustics remain number one complaint in these types of buildings. Some very interesting research showing that, or sort of established a causal link between poor acoustics and stress levels in, in, in workers, and also a uh, causal link between productivity and, and acoustic conditions. Um, in educational buildings, we see something similar. Uh, lots of studies showing that when the acoustics are bad, then students, they perform worse 
both on all kinds of tasks like listening tasks or, or memory tasks or, or, or reading tasks or on, on standardized tests. And even some interesting research showing that Reporting students they oh that uh, that um, yeah they students they judge their peers less positively and the teachers too when 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 the acoustics are bad. In healthcare, similarly, um, research shows that acoustics are directly linked with uh, with with our capabilities to heal. Uh, when the acoustics are bad, we see extended hospital stays. We see uh, less, or oh, sorry, more cases of rehospitalization. We see more usage of pain medication. Obviously, noise and, and acoustics impact our ability to sleep and 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 so on. So, um, yeah, very critical in healthcare facilities. And there was one survey that surveyed many different hospitals across the globe and found that actually none of them are fulfilling the the World Health Organization's uh, criteria for noise levels in, in hospitals. Then when we go outside, again, very uh, environmental noise is a major health hazard. In fact, the World Health Organization says that environmental noise is the second most harmful environmental factor affecting human health, just after bad air quality. Environmental noise is on the rise. And uh, yeah, and the World Health Organization also says that in Europe alone, one million healthy life years are lost every year due to environmental noise. And then last but not least, obviously in concert halls, cultural spaces, music spaces, it's important to have, to have good acoustics. So I hope this sort of little rant of mine here has convinced you that uh, sound and acoustics do influence us and it is important that we think about that during building design and that we could probably do a little bit better than what we're doing now. Fino, um, yeah. sorry, sorry to interrupt. We have a, a request from someone just on this very topic. <laughs> cool. Do you have a way to use uh, earphones uh, so that your speech is more intelligible? Oh, it sounds try. okay for me, but I do hear the room. Right. Yeah. I have headphones here. Give me a second. Just while you're ranting. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it would be a shame if I wouldn't be heard in this. It thing. would be. I'm connecting now. Let's see. Uh, do you hear me now? I do hear you. Excellent. Okay. Um, I'm just going to switch off my phone so it doesn't. All right. Okay. Um, where was I? Yeah. So, Treble is not a very old company. We're a little over a year old, but uh, our roots go back many years uh, in R&D, particularly research at DTU. Um, just to mention a few of my great colleagues there, Chil Ho, Professor uh, Chil Ho Jung, Professor Alan Engsi Karup, PhD student Hermes San Pedro, um, Jan Hesteman from EPFL, um, Tim Warburton from Virginia Tech. These are all collaborators that uh, contributed greatly to, to the research back in the day. But anyway, some five, six years ago when we started this, um, we essentially, uh, this was the first question that we asked ourselves, can we develop some technology or some methods that can make sound a more integral part of building design such that we end up you know shaping spaces with sound in mind selecting materials doing space planning all sort of driven by or influenced by sound and this is what led us to to uh, virtual acoustics uh, so i say here that we're developing building modeling technology of the future um, our idea is actually fairly straightforward. What we want is for sound to become an integral part of the building models of the 3D models that architects and engineers are working in every day. Um, this way, we're hoping that we don't just use our eyes when we're evaluating our designs, but also our ears. Um, in other words, we're kind of trying to bring these models to life such that we end up you know, evaluating buildings, not when they're empty or sort of frozen in time, but rather when they're in their functioning state and kind of, kind of full of life. Um, and this is what our virtual acoustics technology enables. It enables us to generate these real-time virtual or audio-visual renderings of buildings where you can see how it looks and hear how it sounds. You can interact with the design. You can walk around in the model and, and so on and so forth. 
you can both do this using VR or sort of head mounted displays and, and headphones and that gives you a bit more immersive experience, but you could also do it actually uh, in a bit more lo-fi setting where you just have your headphones on and kind of like playing a first person video game on, on your computer. Um, all right, but just to take one step back and, and explain a little bit better what's going on there behind the scenes. Uh, so this slide here illustrates sort of the process involved. We essentially have to perform a simulation uh, of, of how sound propagates in the domain. Um, and we start with some input data. Uh, that is a 3D model of the geometry in question. Whether that's an interior space or an outdoor domain doesn't really matter so much. Uh, we also need some information about the sound or sorry, the surfaces in the space, um, the acoustic properties of the surfaces, and then uh, information about the sound sources present. We then feed this information to an acoustic simulation algorithm that computes how sound essentially radiates from the source, bounces around the environment and reaches the, uh, the listener or the receiver. <clears throat> Excuse me one second. Okay, and then from this simulation algorithm, we can get a lot of information or in different formats, you could say. One way is to just get out kind of graphs and numbers that describe the acoustic quality of the space. That can be very useful in certain cases. For example, if we want to assess whether a space fulfills some regulatory requirements, Another way is that we can actually visualize sound and that can be useful also. For example, when we're designing these kind of ceiling reflectors and concert halls, I want to see the reflection hit all the different seats. Um, but maybe what's most interesting or at least what we're talking about here today is, is um, the rendering part that we can do these audio visual renderings of the spaces so we can experience them uh, in virtual reality before they're built. Our sort of take on this is, is, uh, is shown here. We are essentially plugging into the 3D modeling tools that the architects and engineers are using. So the old interface and all the link to the architectural model is, is, is in these programs. We then feed this input data to a cloud-based simulator. And the reason I highlight the cloud is because if we want to do accurate simulations of, of sound and acoustics in a virtual domain, then we actually have to perform pretty hefty calculations um, and this would be quite difficult to do without the power of the cloud where we can use these modern massively parallel computing architectures to, to really accelerate the simulations. And then the output can is in kind of in two formats. One is kind of a more of an analysis suite where we can look at all those graphs and numbers and so on that's kind of incorporated here into these tools. But the other part is that we can take the output and, and experience the acoustics uh, in a VR setting. And then we link to these visualization engines like Unreal and Unity. I'm focusing mostly on this part here in, in, in this talk. Um, here's an overview of, of the main sort of tech, uh, tech aspects that have been developed throughout the years. I, I could spend you know, an hour talking about each one of them. There's a lot of research that lies behind, but I'll just touch upon them briefly. So one is that we've developed a new way to simulate how sound propagates in, in, a, in a domain using so-called wave-based methods. And this gives us the ability to, to, to do more accurate, realistic renderings and simulations. The one other aspect is a, is a real-time playback engine, which sort of takes those simulation results and enables us to, to experience, do the real-time virtual experience. Um, another aspect which we spend a lot of effort on is actually how we model uh, room surfaces and their interaction with, with, the, with the sound in the room. Uh, room surfaces actually have a major influence on the acoustics of spaces and, and for, especially for certain types of materials, it can be quite complex physics that occur when a sound wave hits the surface and is reflected back. And we need to capture those physics accurately if we want to do a realistic and authentic rendering of a space. So we developed some methods to, to, to do that for certain types of materials. And last part here is a bit more of a practical problem, but still very important is kind of this uh, link to the architectural models and having a seamless workflow going from those complex details, architectural models to something that we can run a simulation on. Here's an illustration of, of the simulation engine or the approach here, the, comparing the wave-based approach to, to what's typically done uh, in other acoustic analysis tools and, and sound rendering engines, 
which is more of a, a ray tracing or geometrical acoustics approach. This is kind of okay for very high frequencies, but for low and medium frequencies, we have a lot of these wave effects, things like diffraction, sound wave bending around obstacles, uh, which we neglect in these wave-based approaches. So for example, when the animation restarts, you can see the sound wave here in the wave-based approach, it bends around this partition wall, whereas here in the geometrical simulation, we, we don't see any of this wave effect. Um, one quick here, uh, one example of some experimental validation or comparing different simulation approaches. So here we have a sound source emitting a sound wave that hits this sort of fairly complex surface and is reflected back. And if you focus your attention here first to the right, uh, this is a measurement from a, from a database, which is called the ground truth for room acoustic simulations. And then you see here, the black line is the measured curve. It's the frequency response between the source and the listener in that, in that setting. And then all these different curves here are different geometrical acoustics tools trying to, to model this, this scenario. And in all cases, you see that they cannot capture the measured transfer function because they don't include the wave nature of sound. Whereas here, if we use a wave-based approach, then we capture the, this, this behavior quite well. This was for a static scenario. If we start talking about more of an interactive scenario where you're walking around the space and so on, it becomes even more critical to think about the wave nature of sound. Consider, for example, this here when we have a sound source uh, and a listener and there's something, something very small like a lamp post uh, blocking the line of sight between the source and the listener. And as you move your head here and you know go from seeing the source to not seeing the source and kind of back and forth, then you would get a very unnatural jump in level if you don't include the wave nature of sound, which is kind of bend in reality, you know, a small lamppost doesn't really influence at all when a sound is coming from behind it because sound bends around, around it, that's the diffraction. And kind of an analogous problem is here, here uh, where you have a big surface and a small slit. And yeah, this is due to diffraction, which is this phenomenon of sound waves bending around obstacles. And, and sound waves bending around corners, like you see here, for example. Okay, uh, I think this is the last slide of the, of the technical part. Uh, here I'm just illustrating how at least we approach this now, this uh, way of setting up these virtual experiences. And then after this, I'll go on to show you some demos. So we have we kind of do it in two parts. We have a pre-computation or an offline stage where we sort of bake the accurately simulated acoustics into the model. And then we have a runtime stage where we can walk around the model and move the head and interact with the design on the fly and, and, and uh, experience. It. And we essentially simulate the impulse responses of the room in, in a grid of points across the domain. We embed some spatial information into each point using ambisonics. And then during runtime, there is a real-time processor that's doing interpolation between the nearest points and um, and ambisonics decoding depending on what your orientation is and so on. So you're always hearing sound kind of coming from the right direction. So that's kind of an overview of, of this VR system. Okay, <clears throat> to wrap things up, I wanna show you two case studies um, where we use this in practice. The first one, well, both were done with Henning Glass and Architects. Uh, the first one here is uh, the new city hall in Uppsala in Sweden. Um, and in particular, we were focused on this very large atrium space here in the middle of the, of the building. It's a tricky space from a sound perspective. It's very large. It's surrounded by glass all around, glass ceiling also, hard floor. It's open to the public. So at times there will be a lot of people going through. There's a cafe in there. There's people working. And we have the main sort of city hall right next to it here. So we, during the design of this, we, we set up a virtual mock-up of this space and that mock-up proved to be very helpful in, in helping the architects and the stakeholders to, to explore different design options and understand the impact of different design options and, and make informed decisions. I'll show you a video from it. Um, in the video, you will see a user walking around the space and with the click of a button on her hand controller, she can interact with the design. She can, for example, change how many people are in the room going from being completely empty to being just a few people to being kind of full. We even put a little jazz band there in the corner where the, where the cafe is. 
she can change the acoustic treatment. When the acoustic treatment is off, then it's kind of noisy and, and reverberant. And when it's on, it's more comfortable and, and quiet. Um, she can clap to listen to the reverb. And then she'll go into the main city hall where she can select some surfaces, um, change the acoustic tree or the, the surface finish, you can say. I think she then turns off the sound source in the room to listen to the sound isolation properties, how much sound is going through the glass uh, from the outside. And then, all right, so let's just play it. It's meant to be listened to in headphones, by the way. But, yeah. made up of words that come to me spontaneously words that speak the honest truth expect from me nothing else because i do not believe fellow athenians that i should be appearing before you at my age behaving like a child trying to construct over adorned speeches this is the only thing I hope it went through okay, <laughs> or at least you got the, the main idea here. Um, so actually one of the outcomes of, of doing this virtual mock-up was that we ended up designing these wooden frames here that were sort of incorporated into every element of the glass facade that surrounds the space. And these wooden frames, they have sort of the dual function of, of both looking great, but also absorbing sound in this way, kind of contributing towards a comfortable indoor climate there. And uh, I think this is just a nice example of what can happen when we when we uh, think about sound in the early design stages. Okay, the second example is uh, from an office building. This was uh, an old office building in Copenhagen that was being renovated. Was, and um, going from sort of traditional closed style offices to modern open plan offices. And the, and the client was quite concerned about sound there. Um, you know, people's ability to have privacy and concentrate and, and productivity and so on. So so we did a virtual mock-up again of, of an open plan of office area in the building where we were kind of trying to show the client that we were seriously thinking about sound and, and doing some measures to ensure good acoustics and soundscapes in there. And again, I'll show you a video from, from the virtual mock-up. In the video, you see now it's a bit of an older demo. The user can kind of turn on and off various aspects of the acoustic design, like changing the ceiling material, changing some wall absorbing materials, putting in some different types of partitions, glass partitions and, and, and uh, absorbing partitions and so on. So let's take a look. Ich 
Det var faktisk logistik, der var det aller, aller spørgsmål. Ja, for I lavede bygninger ned på Amager, sådan urstænkter til Nordjylland og fik kontakt på det. Ja, det er ikke godt. Det er ikke det, det er min skyld. Det er, vi udviklede... Nej, Okay. Ah, <clears throat> uh, yeah. This is my last slide, actually. I just wanted to mention no more. We're in trouble. We've been developing this kind of new technology to simulate and render sound in virtual worlds that is very accurate and 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 has the potential to be very authentic and realistic. And right now, we're we're developing products, software products out of this for, for architects and engineers to work better with sound in, in building design. But sort of down the road, we actually see that this could be used in various various applications where it's desirable to have authentic sound in, in a virtual world, whether that's a video game or some VR applications or car cabins or, or whatever. So just sort of between us, this is what we're thinking for the future. And that was it for me. Just thanks everyone for listening. It was a lot of fun to be here today to present this work. Work, And if you have any questions, just go ahead. Thanks. Thank you so much. That was really impressive. Um, I have some questions again. <laughs> awesome. That's all right. I'm <laughs> just kind of wondering what, because that looks really impressive, but how, if I came to you as a customer and said, can you do a mock-up of this? Like, is it your whole team working for one year to create that mock-up of their office? Or is it like I can buy the tool and I can plug in where the desks are going to be myself? Or what is the, the product yeah, going to be like? Yeah. <laughs> That's a great question. It's more the latter. So we're not, we're not a service that makes these models for others, but we're developing the tools that enable architects and engineers to do these models themselves. The, we have all of the backend technology ready and, and it works well, but we're working a bit sort of on the software user facing aspects uh, to make this very seamless and smooth. And that's, so these, this, we're talking about a product that we're planning to release in maybe one year's time or something like that. So it's still in development, but that's, that's the idea. Okay, great. So that would be the acoustic engineers at those uh, large engineering companies, I imagine. Or exactly. Yeah. yeah, both, I guess, but maybe yeah, primarily the acoustics engineers, but yeah. Yeah, and it really takes into account um, not just the surface materials, but the, the the full building materials, how thick is the wall and... Yeah, exactly. It's That's a whole world, really, how, you know, how these surfaces interact with with uh, with the, the acoustics of the room and there's many different ways to approach that and there's also some limitations that we struggle with just as an industry in general on how we you know characterize the performance of these different surfaces but but yeah yeah because they're different well actually i'm not a a, a builder myself <laughs> but i know that from my own renovation project there's a million different products and that's different in each country so how Will you manage that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there are some standard ways to 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 characterize different materials and so on, but it's still, you know, then you put it. Do you put it on the wall directly, or do you have something in front, or you know, between the material and the wall, and what's the buildup of the wall behind, and so on? It's uh, it's quite, you know, and you, when you, you can see why you need cloud uh, computing for this. <laughs> yeah, um, we actually have some questions from the audience. Great. Um, from FME, hi Fino, thank you for your very impressive presentation. Is it possible to calculate impulse responses based on your wave-based method in real time or is it already the case? Not in real time. That would be pretty awesome if we could, but when using the wave-based approach, uh, it's it's heavier. So, so we need to do it in the offline stage kind of before the, the virtual runtime experience. So maybe maybe sometime in the future, but that then we need yeah. really big cloud. Really big cloud. Well, Massive exactly. cloud. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, and from Nadej, perhaps if that's how to pronounce it. Um, okay, yeah, he said, I can imagine the great possibilities to set up the ideal Foley auditorium in post-production film, for mm. example. Mm -hmm. That's something I have not thought about, but that's very interesting. Yeah, I agree. And our experts from our creative sound solutions 
work group um, have said this is a huge problem, the cost of uh, both Foley and also um, yeah, fixing everything in post, essentially. Yeah. <laughs> you could uh, save a lot of time and money if you already had the, the environment set up and you could right. record it in that space again. Interesting. Pretty interesting yeah. point. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Very interesting. Um, Mansour says, regarding the sources included in the demos, do you take into account their directivity pattern? That, that is something we're working on. Um, so yeah, I, I would say yes. That's, yeah. It's still, you know, we're tweaking the fine de details of it, but yes. All right. And finally, from James O'Sullivan, would the software work from Unity or would it be plugging it into Revit, for example? Uh, right now, right now we're using Unity to do to do the virtual experience part. So we kind of go from the Revit model and, and into Unity uh, like that, but we, we are working on making the whole experience a bit more seamless and maybe coupling different visualization tools. There are some visualization tools that are directly incorporated into Revit, but yeah, it's kind of, there are different ways to approach this and we don't have like a clean cut answer to how we're going to do this yet, but we hope to support all the main tools that are being used by the industry. Great. And uh, before we finish up, I hear that you're, Hiring? Yes. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Just a small out. plug, if yeah. anyone. <laughs> exactly. I don't know if what anyone... the positions are, but. No, right. Yeah. Please reach out if you want to work with us or if you want to collaborate or if you're just interested or if you want to, if you have some questions or whatever, please do. Uh, I always love to talk, talk about this stuff. So. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Of course. So now we will move on to our last speaker of the day that is. Jan Kopje. Um, Jan is many things, so there's a huge list here. I have a composer, a producer, an engineer, a journalist, a researcher, and a teacher. Um, he has been the head of the sound line at the Danish National School for Performing Arts um, for six years, but then he stopped that uh, last year, and now he is working full-time in his company, uh, Studio Oval, or just Oval, um, and he has won several international prizes for his work. Um, we've heard from our network that this, uh, pres maybe not this presentation, but yeah, a previous presentation you made was mind bending. So uh, looking forward to that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. For Thank you so here. much for the uh, um, introduction or the invitation. And thanks also for two great presentations beforehand. It's going to be, um, I guess, in a way, um, uh, something complementary I'm going to talk about. So uh, let's see, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm not going to spend too much time on myself, uh, more on my research. Uh, I've spent actually uh, the few last years uh, of my time at the Dansk Sinekunskule, like the Danish National School of Performing Arts in English, uh, doing some artistic research uh, on the subject of absurd sounds. Uh, that subject was a bit wider than that, but I had a publication on Absurd Sound on Journal of Artistic Research. I'm going to go for my presentation now. So just a second. It's going to be easier. Um, let's take this one and that one and share sound. So let's see. Now, now it, it should, should be working. working. Yeah. yeah. We so, can so see it, but we can also hear the echo. You can, can hear, hear the echo. echo. That's, that's nice. nice. It is nice. Now it should be better. Yes, that's great. Yes, great. Thanks a lot. So uh, my presentation is there, right? So making sound for real virtuality. So the idea is this, what if there was no virtual reality? It's a bit of a strange concept, really, um, but I'm going to get to it. Um, first, I need to talk about the absurd uh, and go through this link. Uh, it's on the research catalog uh, called like this, and then it will lead you to this page. Uh, you will get the presentation after this, so you can actually always go there. Um, in this presentation, uh, you have three parts. It's about 
uh, absurd sounds, which I'm going to develop, and you have silence, sweet spot, and reality. And everything is linked. Of course, the part that interests us is the virtual reality part, but we'll get there. Um, so, what is it that I've been uh, trying to do uh, in this research? Well, um, <clears throat> um, First, if I talk a bit about uh, um, the plan here, uh, the relation to virtual reality, before I even talk about the absurd. I went from documenting a sound installation to generating prototypes uh, for uh, sound installations or um, performances and towards developing new answers to complex acoustic problems and then recreate the real world, modify the real world, and developing new, a new world, let's say, based on actually virtual reality instead of doing the opposite. Now, um, if I uh, go back uh, to the absurd, when you look into the different presentations, you'll have um, um, some elements about what I did. The idea is to uh, uh, question basic uh, uh, facts in a very... Uh, 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 in a way, cynical way, you know, um, um, using a bit the principles behind conspiracy theories and apply them to art. So like absurd premises followed by uh, logical developments, right? So for instance, what if silence was a building tool with which we carve music and sounds into blocks of noise, right? Or uh, what if uh, silence was actually uh, uh, louder than noise? Right? And that's the first point uh, I use in here. So these simple questions, they basically question uh, uh, the way we think. So it can be uh, questioning the uh, characteristics of sound, but it can be questioning uh, almost everything. And I worked a lot in collaboration with other artists and every time I got mind-bending, let's uh, I'm using the word you used before, Shelley, uh, mind-bending results, something that was always unsuspected and exciting. So I'm not going to present the whole of it. You can uh, go there yourself. Um, the first part is about uh, harvesting rare sounds. So it ended up uh, being about recording worms in an, echo an echoic chamber. It uh, started with this and then ended up um, making a concert for worms, a multi-channel concert for worms uh, in vitrines uh, while uh, uh, discussing about uh, uh, what silence really is. Um, in this installation, I got a problem. It's that uh, I had made talks, uh, films, pictures, uh, uh, I had all the recordings, everything, and nothing was good enough um, to document, actually, the sound or the, the installation, but on the sound uh, part. And uh, that's the first reason why I went into virtual reality. I'm going to get into the uh, details about that just later on. My second example is about Sweet Spot. It's also an interesting one. I found out, uh, which is not a very big discovery in a way, that the Sweet Spot, which is the place where the sound is best, is a, a kind of a weird uh, concept. It's a very much anthropocentric way. Um, of listening to the world. We are always in the center, you know, a bit like in the 14th century uh, when actually all uh, explorers thought, uh, I don't know, uh, the French ones thought France was in the center of the world and the English ones thought England was in the center of the world and we still have this idea very much implanted in us. So I went into different places and uh, studied some uh, complex acoustics and you can see that for instance this uh, big tower uh, water tower in Bronzehoi next to Copenhagen it has this crazy acoustics uh, with more than 30 seconds uh, reverberation in the low end and the reverberation is so complex that it's very difficult to actually recreate uh, I would be very curious to know what uh, Finno can do about that but in my case the artistic uh, developments were very complicated in this area. So I had to find some things. Also, if I throw marbles in a room, do I really need to be in the very center of the room to actually hear the marbles in the best way? Wherever I am, I will hear them correctly, right? So I got some clues about how to work. Also, um, um, like find new ways of recording, uh, which I will uh, explain a bit later, of something quite simple, not based so much on technology, but on ideas, right? That's the whole idea behind the absurd sounds. 
work more with ideas and concepts and a bit less with technology. Of course, I ended up doing virtual reality and multi-channel stuff. So uh, not a complete success in that way, but I try to do it in the simplest form. And, and uh, this led to many of the things that I'll be talking about in the end. Uh, I had to uh, work with a, or make a, a performance with 120 speakers in an auditorium, sitting instead of uh, uh, the audience, right? And the audience would arrive on stage. So I had very little time to prepare for that, so I needed to um, uh, um, prototype. And there I went to virtual reality again. And the third part will be about virtual reality. That's where we are. That's what I'm going to present more now. But now we have an introduction. How I got solutions to different problems and how it evolved in the end. Good. Back to the presentation itself. The absurd, right? So, um, my first question then was how to document sound art. And I went for Unity uh, as a simple solution. How can I basically have my videos and my movement and how can I actually hear the different parts in relation to each other because that's how it should be and how can I decide what I want to listen to well that's basically virtual reality in a nutshell so um, I hope you have a stereo sound uh, at home because now I'm going to play a video if it's not stereo you will be able to uh, to find it on my website anyway in this one it is impossible to imagine our current society without rare earth elements. The electrochemical properties of so these 17 have, elements um, are driving voice. technology development. That's supposed to be on the, the left on the little century. table. We have three From small podiums um, that generate sound, each one of them with transducers, which you can see here, right? Our cloud-based digital existence is and then closely we have connected to the earth. Uh, some transducers used on the wooden panel on the, 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 on the left here. And then we arrive in the room where the worms are. And these are recordings of the worms mixed with other, um, let's say, musical parts. And there's a video in there, um, and so on. This is very much, um, uh, this is very much, let's say, an old-fashioned way of doing it, or at least it feels old to me, something I did uh, four years ago now. Um, in this case, the acoustics is not really used, and the system use is very basic. So you can hear the different sources of sound, but uh, you don't really have a feeling of the space. This was happening in, in uh, Oergelen uh, Institute of uh, uh, Contemporary Art, where the acoustics is actually terrible. And so it sounds actually better in a way uh, here than it sounded in reality. So um, it, it works, uh, I would say, but it does not really reflect the real place. Now, um, the next step um, happened to be uh, something I did with Carl Emil Carlsen at the Danish National School of Performing Arts, which we called Hybrid Hall. It was a test with 16 loudspeakers, uh, 16 Meyer loudspeakers, so very expensive uh, setup in a way, uh, in a production room for theater, in which we had two windows uh, on an alt alternate reality. And it was a virtual reality for one person at a time, without uh, the use of glasses and without the use of headphones. So you would have one person tracked and all the perspectives and sounds would vary depending on where you were placed and where you were going, right? So it's all happening real time. Um, and that proved to be a very interesting thing. The point is, um, first it blurs a bit the real and the virtual, which is nice. But afterwards I realized um, I could maybe do a test with that and blend uh, this into virtual reality. So I don't have the visuals uh, because um, it was not so much the point. It was some kind of proof of concept. What if instead of placing sounds, which I have recorded in here, it's synthesis mostly, but what if instead of placing them into an, a space which has acoustics included or not, right? Calculated or not. Uh, what if instead of this, I actually took the real 
loudspeakers, like the 16 loud loudspeakers, and consider them as audio sources uh, in my uh, virtual reality setup. So I did a test and it proved actually very close uh, to the original and very much less expensive, of course. Uh, the goal is not the same, like the result is not the same. You're not alone in a big room without glasses and headphones on the opposite, but uh, it was acoustically uh, surprisingly working. Still doesn't take into account the acoustics of the room. So here stereo is important. You can see visualization on the screen. So, I don't know if you hear the stereo correctly in there, otherwise you'll find the video on my website and, and you'll, you'll get an idea about that. But the point here, the most interesting point is that it doesn't make a big difference, I mean, from, from a lot of other things you've heard, I mean, it's not so much more impressive. The only thing is here, you actually have 16 sources of sound at the same time, they all play the same file right? Except they all play it from their own perspective, right? So I'm actually recreating the 16 loudspeakers with 16 audio sources in there and they're all playing at the same time. So what we hear actually is a, a combination, a mix of these 16 sound sources which each one is a loudspeaker, right? It's a bit confusing because the loudspeaker is an audio source in there, right? It's a supposed to be something generating sound, well, well actually, actually it is, but it's, coming, it's becoming even more blurry in the next example. So in here uh, we get something which functions exactly in the same way in the virtual and in the real, wherein uh, usually I would use a software like Spat Revolution or I would do something in Unity where I would make my sounds move and they would be calculated. Here it's not the case. Um, what I only play in Unity is 16 audio files synchronized. Uh, in the next example, I went further and uh, I called that recording spaces. So I was actually thinking about it. What if I actually wanted to record the space, right? Uh, I was working with Kit Johnson, the choreographer. Uh, we had a workshop, just the two of us, and I was very fascinated by her use of space. Um, how she can load the space with energy and I wanted to capture that and I couldn't. I tried different things and all my attempts were totally ridiculous. And before I went to virtual reality, I did this setup which I put as a picture uh, on top of uh, like uh, inside my virtual reality uh, setup in which I had uh, eight microphones uh, to the floor and I threw a lot of marbles. And then on the other side of the room, I have eight loudspeakers placed exactly the same. I record uh, to the left, let's say, with the microphones, send marbles, and then I play on the loudspeakers and see what if there was no sweet spot? What if there was no place where I should be? So what if all of these points were just equal uh, in quality, you know, in what they give? And the result was stunning. People could hear and visualize the marbles, although they were not there, which is why I call it invisible choreography. Uh, this technique, let's say, um, which actually, if you take the initials, it mean it makes IC, which I find funny for an invisible thing. But choreography, because it's movement that you have to prepare and organize before you record it, and then invisible because, well, that's something you cannot see. Or the point is not to see it. Indeed, how will you make a marble roll? through a hall if you record it. Like in a classic technique, I would record an object and I would make it move right inside a Unity or whatever system you use. But recording a rolling marble is not so easy, right? Because it's moving. Should I follow the marble and then just recreate the movement in Unity? Should I record it and play it as a stereo file and then hope it works? Well, in this case, I don't care. 
I actually recorded the room. I did not record the marbles. It happens so that in the room where the marbles were, there were microphones, right? So there was something happening, but it was uh, almost a coincidence. I came to record the room. So what you can experience is a recording of the room. And of course, it translates also very well in virtual reality, although not as good as in reality uh, in this case. But I, sh I have experimented more and made it better afterwards. But that's an early case. So let's hear it. It's a bit lo low on levels. So I'm a little bit afraid that the um, uh, sound quality of a Zoom uh, conference will make it not good enough. But this is not only accessible uh, on my website. You can also, or from the, from the research uh, document, you can also download the application for Mac and PC and try it for yourself, which is much more interesting. So take, it, uh, take my word for it and then you try it yourself and you'll see. There is potential in it. So um, this I got to develop afterwards. Um, the whole thing led me to develop new techniques, so new ways of recording. Here I use the same technique to record a piano, a grand piano, uh, which uh, I then placed like three, three instances of it in a huge space with four voices and made a requiem out of it with four rooms, which it, each one having a piano placed inside a hall and the audience would be uh, capable of going almost inside the piano or from one piano to the other and basically listen uh, to the music from different perspectives. Uh, I work with new panning laws in the same way so you can see below and I'll get to that afterwards uh, this Max MSP um, patch which basically uh, links uh, panning uh, to frequential content instead of uh, linking it to time or to amplitude and that gives completely uh, interesting instruments and new types of composition because when you take all those things into account you get something different. So um, the part about prototyping was as I said much more uh, important when I got to work on this who's listening uh, thing with 120 loudspeakers. Uh, in this case I used uh, 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 very different techniques but virtual reality was my way to actually listen uh, to complex, very complex pieces from any point of view in the room. So in this case, you have the main hall at uh, the culture yard in Helsinger, Denmark, which is uh, 800 seats. And uh, I use the C in that example uh, so that basically you have waves coming in uh, inside the room and basically invading the room from the stage uh, to the upper side of, of the room. So the people who are sitting in the end will only have the bigger waves coming up to them. Um, and the ones in the front will get them all, um, the small and the big ones. And the big ones will go way in their back. Um, and this kind of stuff, uh, working with 120 speakers, is very complicated. And I had two days to basically install everything, test it, calibrate the system and actually uh, work on the compositions. Impossible. Uh, knowing I should do uh, six different days with six different experiments and each time there was like an hour of sound. So I did everything uh, by prototyping in Unity, which is a very good way to work with sound art, I would say. So I'll show an example. It's not maybe the best of all of them, but that's the one I rendered. This one is not available mostly because the amount of sound sources is too big for most computers um, uh, just to compute real time because here you have actually I limited it to 64 speakers in this case 64 speakers is 64 times the whole sound 
you know, perform from each speaker's point of view. And then we blend through them. So think about the amount. This is several gigabytes of uh, audio data. So you can see it. The white tubes, uh, or whatever you call it, cylinders, cylinders, they are where people are supposed to uh, sit. The black boxes with numbers are loudspeakers. For now, the C is not coming through. It's going to come in a moment. It's mostly people walking on the beach. Waiting a bit, it should come now. Yes. So after a while, we should be moving around and listening to it from another point of view. So this allowed me basically to um, test my prototype and see that it would not be too loud at that place because there was a speaker just behind or that it would not be too distorted or different things. I used a lot of different types of compositions in this one. Uh, for instance, the one with the three pianos and the four voices, the Requiem was in there. I made something in which each loudspeaker was one popcorn ready to pop and then the whole audience would be in a, in a pot with oil boiling and popcorns jumping which would kind of expand the universe at some point, and so on and so on. Right? So, let's move on. This you can also listen to uh, on my website. It's not, uh, it's no big deal. Uh, you will have a better experience, I'm pretty sure. So, um, the next stage is what I call expanding the real. So in this case, I worked with uh, Runa Magnusson, sound artist Runa Magnusson, on some uh, project which we called uh, uh, a soft fall, so it's a big um, uh, sound installation uh, with 10 loudspeakers in a huge water tower. That's the one I was talking about before. And I wanted to prototype in it, but it proved impossible uh, to prototype with uh, virtual reality because of the crazy acoustics that were part of this um, uh, experience experiment. Um, the acoustics were so complex, uh, really, that uh, uh, that uh, from a three meters distance, when you talk with someone, your voice disappears, right? It's not disap it doesn't disappear. Everything becomes blurry and nobody can understand the end of your sentence. So uh, I had to actually uh, work in a different way. And what we did with Runa is that we actually created an installation in there, spent a lot of time inside the building and then recorded it. Not in the way that I did, um, uh, that I uh, uh, documented the first project you saw with the worms, but in this case using the uh, uh, invisible choreography system. So that I used microphones uh, to record the speakers, but also the acoustics. And then you are walking in the middle of the final result that includes a very complex acoustic system. Uh, in all its complexity, really, and um, and uh, you won't hear uh, like uh, footsteps and stuff like that because it's out of uh, of question for for uh, uh, this kind of sound art uh, project. But um, but uh, we got a very realistic uh, thing, which has uh, different implications. First, you can actually walk in there. It's a very good documentation. Um, <clears throat> Uh, just a second, I got something here. Oh, that's annoying. Just no, yeah. So, yes. Um, so, uh, where was I? Uh, I got a message on my screen that said I should unmute, but it's not the case. That's fine. So, we got a very good, anyway, we got a very good uh, acoustic definition, but also we can recreate this in the real world, which is what I'm gonna go to afterwards, which is amazing. We can actually recreate this very complex acoustic, including everything, meaning people walking around, 
if the, you, you could hear the people there uh, if there are any and you can hear the cars coming outside you can hear pigeons in the building and the whole sound installation and I can recreate it outdoors anywhere really um, by placing loudspeakers instead uh, of those balls that you can see there which represent actually the microphones so microphones become loudspeakers they become sound sources let's go for it if it works yes I also added a few things. You can remove the walls, which has no incidence on the acoustics at this stage. You can remove the speakers. And walk around and of course you have uh, stairs so you can also go upstairs the original building is 26.5 meters high or the room is 25 26.5 meters high so you can actually walk up the stairs so I used actually 14 uh, mics in this case so it's not just one mic for each uh, loudspeaker it's a bit more than that all right so I'm gonna stop it now before we go up the stairs and we'll tell you a bit what's happening upstairs upstairs I made another installation which is based on the max patch you saw beforehand this instrument that we made with Xavier de Carpentry French musician and programmer um, uh, in which uh, basically we divide uh, a sound uh, like a, we create panning depending on the, um, uh, on the frequencies and in this case we used uh, or I used 51 loudspeakers to recreate the sea but I modified the uh, sound characteristics simply saying well um, it would look like if you see these three documents you have the first one up left upper left it shows where the uh, speakers are placed the one just below shows you how it would sound I mean it shows you basically the the um, the, dis the depth uh, field of each loudspeaker and then the one to the right which is bigger is what I did meaning um, Depending on the speakers the laws of acoustics are not the same. Uh, they're also uh, directional in all kinds of uh, weird ways and it means that uh, the composition is such that you Will hear more, some speakers all the way some you will only hear when you're very close to them uh, even though they're at constant level and they all reproduce the sound of the sea recorded sound of the sea except you never hear it as such you will hear uh, some um, uh, composition mostly like triads and stuff like that different frequential contents put together creating chords and you basically make your mix a bit like you would work with standing waves but here it's not the case this would be very difficult to replicate uh, in the real world really uh, it looks like this they're up so same type of microphones the C is gone up and that's what happens when we arrive there the level will be very low so I encourage you to test this one uh, you can download it and completely uh, test it for yourself and spend hours in it it's actually a release it's an album you could say it's an hour of music plus this so here you won't hear much I guess because it's very delicate Let's say it's a very meditative uh, place which you're welcome to explore I'm not sure zoom will uh, give it justice um, a brief uh, part on recreating the virtual into the real which I discussed beforehand I actually recreated the installation in the tower 
uh, based on the virtual uh, reality thing in a smaller room, a slightly smaller room at uh, the Danish National School of Performing Arts. And by doing so, I used 10 loudspeakers. Here you can see some of them seen from above. Um, and uh, I made a very basic uh, system saying, well, the room is, let's say, um, 0 0.8. Uh, times the original room in size or, or the circle I'm creating let's say is 80% so what I did is that uh, I uh, accelerated uh, accordingly uh, uh, the sound files so they are pitched a little bit higher so that my actual room uh, is not uh, destroyed in terms of, um, of phase right so to keep a coherent phase I just had to accelerate it so Providing I'm not doing it too much, I get something which is still coherent and the result is totally working. Meaning that uh, uh, some people spend some time in this room uh, enjoying being in a completely different tower. Meaning the uh, water tower that you saw before with the like, crazy acoustics. Whereas here we're in a relatively controlled acoustics, it's a theater tower. So um, um, uh, it was also kind of a proof of concept, but something that inherently worked. Um, you can hear a little bit of it here, just taken with a phone. The interesting part is the acoustics you hear has nothing to do with the room really. It's another place. But it's coherent, no matter where you go. And it's the same result. So, um, the next example on the side is the same thing, but this time um, it's what you had at the top of the tower in the virtual reality application but this time placed in the real world uh, at the Royal Academy the same system uh, that uh, Stefania was talking uh, about in the beginning in her presentation so with 44 plus 4 uh, uh, loudspeakers and in there I actually used the C and made it play uh, like uh, every loudspeaker is playing a little bit of it so it was just to say when we're in the center, we hear the C as if it was just a perfect recording. And when we go to each loudspeakers, it just totally makes no sense. They all play some kind of uh, noise mixed with some random frequencies that don't blend at all. Uh, but I'm not going to play that one because I have a few more things I want to show. So let's move to the next part. And all the loudspeakers. No, okay. Um, I want to talk a bit about the new potentials. Uh, of what I call then real virtuality. That's when actually virtual reality and reality blend for me. It's a bit of a pun, um, but I find it uh, quite interesting to see that these techniques I've developed uh, coherently. I didn't have this plan in the beginning, but it all ended up with virtual reality uh, in a way and with this transposable way of using virtual reality. Something very simple in the end. In most cases, I'm only using something like uh, in the early days, Resonance Audio from Google, and now I use stuff like DRVR. When I, um, I only use the summing into uh, ambisonics, you could say, right? So uh, no effects, no nothing. I just play sound files. I just have to work on them beforehand, working on musical gesture or composition. And likewise with spaces, they become my non-human uh, agents or partners, right, uh, when working with those. When I work on, the, on, the, uh, on as various projects for which I work with stuff like SPAT, you know, like uh, SPAT Revolution and things like that, so like really working with ambisonics or with uh, all, all kinds of different uh, things, but when it gets to exploring spaces like this, I think it's super interesting to have a coherent version and being able to really work on it, not making everything possible, but let people explore the building. So, new potentials. Well, I just uh, uh, will talk about four or five very briefly. This is applications within performing arts. I just finished uh, theater play. 
uh, with uh, Michael Fock as a director at uh, the culture yard in uh, uh, Helsingør called Shadow, or Skuggen in Danish, in which um, uh, it's a continuation to some extent of uh, what I did with Carl Emil Carlsen in the hybrid hall. So there's a, a holographic uh, in, uh, artificial intelligence which is moving and basically uh, discussing um, um, with an actress. And that artificial intelligence is making its own decisions, moving on its own, and I made some generative sound design for it on a, a system with uh, uh, quite a few loudspeakers. So um, the system is running without me, but it's a real theater play, and, uh, and it's based uh, on this idea. A lot of other things can be done within performing arts, though. Um, uh, I've been uh, thinking about uh, uh, exploring intimacy using uh, virtual reality as well. For instance, um, uh, let's say uh, recording uh, what's happening uh, in a bedroom uh, and and uh, with a lot of microphones and then recreating a room uh, in a hotel, for instance. That's just an, an example of an idea. Recreating a room on a hotel and, and let people uh, come in this room and sit on a bed with the with the uh, um, uh, loudspeakers uh, around them, and then and then uh, let them experience uh, somebody else's night, something like that. So um, uh, that is one potential also of such a technique. Um, art installations for museums. This one I'm working on with uh, Luc Perez, uh, who made a fantastic animation movie recently. Uh, should I call it a movie simply because animation is just a technique he's using but every frame is painted by hand and it's based on a book by Carsten Jensen called uh, We the Drowned and uh, the idea is to recreate some rooms uh, that are invaded by water uh, with some specific uh, acoustics uh, in them and some uh, and some uh, uh, historic elements and that would be for some uh, museums based on um, uh, navigation and everything related to the sea. There's a few of them in Denmark. So this is not finished. I'm not going to make you listen to those at the moment. Uh, another point which is very interesting is exploring verticality in sound. So this is a project I'm working on uh, in collaboration with Patrick Lenocher, uh, which I call Folded Towers at the moment. Uh, the interesting part with this one is that verticality is something completely absent from um, sound design in general. It's not totally absent, but very much uh, the case. Virtual reality will allow to do stuff we cannot do even with uh, 40 loudspeakers in a hemisphere, you know, like a, um, a half a sphere uh, with perfect ambisonics. Because you cannot do anything below yourself. It's not going to work. Uh, I was uh, reminded of that because it's a parameter I had c almost forgotten, but I was reminded when working with the candidate students from the Royal Academy of Music in Denmark that uh, that uh, uh, binaural have some. It's it's not necessarily working as well as the real thing, but it also allows you to do stuff which you cannot do otherwise. So I decided to work on virtual reality. Uh, no, sorry, haha, <laughs> verticality sounds a bit the same. Uh, working with a sculptor, which is uh, Patrick Lenocher, he's uh, using folding, wrapping and folding of paper and plastic in all kinds of materials. And then I created with him these towers, which are, let's say, 30, 50 meters high, which you can actually explore by moving in. There's all kinds of systems to just explore. It's only about exploring and the composition uh, depends on the materials and on your position and it will actually, you make the tower vibrate by going on top of it. And it's all about exploring the verticality, like the composition develops as you go up. And it can also develop when you go down as well. So it has to be a reverse, reversible, uh, a reversible system, if you may say. Last point. Um, is immersive acoustic concerts. This one I, I kept for the end. I'm going to make a small demonstration of that one. Uh, it's something which is going to be released in a month. I collaborated this time with Matt Choboter, which is a, a Canadian composer and musician uh, living in Denmark and uh, who's, who finished his studies at the Rhythmic uh, Conservatorium in uh, Conservatory uh, in Copenhagen. Um, 
in this case, uh, he asked me to help him work with space. He was very interested in working with spaces. He's working a lot with, the, he's a pianist and with prepared piano and this kind of stuff. But he was really curious about using spaces. So we discussed and I uh, introduced him to these techniques. He was very uh, interested and I said, okay, let's make a, a, a concert. Uh, like if you perform a concert, I will record it and I, I used this time 16 omnidirectional matched microphones uh, coupled with 16 uh, matched, uh, digitally matched uh, preamps. And I mapped the room exactly like I did in other places. So this room is recreated, right? It's a, a church, a concert church, you could say. Uh, it's used for a lot of concerts uh, in um, Blogos Place, so uh, actually quite close to where I live. And uh, I didn't want to represent the musicians, right? It's still called the invisible choreography, this technique. So this is another proof of concept in which uh, the acoustics of the room is not uh, making everything blend, like in the case of the water tower before. So this is something where we should be able to hear the different instruments. Uh, the blue spot on the floor is a piano. The green one is a bass clarinet, saxophone and a keyboard. Uh, the pink one is uh, percussions, like Balinese gongs and percussions, and the yellow one is drums. So now I'll have to get out of here and open um, actually the virtual reality application itself, so I can actually show it to you a little bit. So we get to see a little bit of something. Let's see. I'll stop sharing and then I'll have to share the other one. Uh, wait a second. Yes, I stopped sharing and now I'm going to, uh, it'll take two seconds or maybe three. Now I'm in, coming back here and sharing. Uh, this way, yes, share sound. There, there we, we are. are, you should, you should be, able be able to, to hear, hear it, it now. now. We can hear it and we can hear the echo on your voice. Yes, yes that's great. great. And that's the thing. thing, I mute it, and that's the thing is that I can't hear it, so that's funny. But you can hear it, right? Oh, no, the church? You can't, yes, no. you can't hear the music, right? I could just hear your voice and the echo. Oh, yeah. yeah. So I'll have to do... Um, that's annoying. So I'll try it a last time. I don't want to spend too much time on it. Otherwise, you'll have to trust me, <laughs> and I'll have to put it uh, to put it uh, online very soon. But it. Yes, you're welcome to share some links with us and we will send yes. to so, today's participants. I'll just try it now for the last time. And if it doesn't work, then we'll stop there. So I'll try to share the sound of it. And then it... No, it actually stops the sound here. Well, I'll just... I'll just tell you briefly something about it. Ah, it's a bit of a shame, but that's how it is. Um, in this case, uh, when you move around, you can go here and hear the drums, like the recording from the drums place. Um, and when you do so, basically you realize that uh, the way we record music, just simply music, uh, it changes all of our perspective because I made it so that you can remove the microphones as well. So uh, you could technically, you know, like remove them like this. You just got a set of keys to remove them and then um, um, listen only with one loudspeaker or just with two or with four. And you can actually also remove the church itself, meaning that you realize really uh, what it is uh, uh, to be in an acoustic space. What you're given to listen to uh, is a deliberate choice from someone, an artist or a sound engineer or a producer, uh, no matter what. 
but really in many many cases it makes little sense so that you could technically and i will stop after that one so if i remember if i remove sorry these ones yes and i only add the loudspeakers that are in the end you should be able from the stage to hear how it would sound if you were in the very end now i hear it coming actually don't know if you hear it yes it's quite low the level but i can yeah, hear it yeah it should be yes i can hear it that's funny yeah so i'll take another piece oh, now we are at it so it's very low though so here yeah it's very low i'm at the piano place and I can explore from the very end. He had musicians from a distance. And the drummer is going to come back. Ah, okay, the sound is a bit messed up. I will stop it now and let questions. That would be more interesting. Um, that's it, actually. Uh, I will, uh, uh, I should maybe just show my last page so you get um, a chance to get my contact if need be. And that would be. Uh, Now I'm making it more complicated for myself, but it's coming now. Yes. yes. And that was it. Thank you so much. At the Studio Oval. Yes. And where is it based? Where is what based? Uh, your where your studio. Uh, studio Oval. Oval is my company. It's in Copenhagen. Okay. But you're yes. working all over on all kinds of projects, I hear. So <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I uh, I move a lot, but at the moment I do a lot of virtual moving. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that makes sense. Uh, thank you so much for sharing you're all welcome. of your projects. Um, it's yeah, it is mind-bending. As someone else described it, I have a question about your. It's quite specific. I don't know if it makes sense now, but uh, I was wondering about your panning laws, your panning mm. um, to frequency yes. content instead of over time. Yes. How does that work? Yeah, it's a funny thing. I was basically trying to, 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 to make different types of, of uh, acoustic laws, basically, uh, like to change them to see like, what, why is it that we believe there's only one way to make panning, for instance, you know? And then, uh, then I looked into what it was related to. So, uh, you know, um, 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 panning is usually related to amplitude, usually it's, or, or it's related to time. So it, you have amplitude and you have envelopes included. And I thought, well, there's one uh, characteristics of sound which is not used, which is frequencies uh, uh, or timber in that way. So why not do panning depending on timber? Uh, so the idea is to, uh, um, to make it very simple to cut the sound in, in a, a lot of, um, like you know basically making a, let's say you could make a simple fft system and and cut the sound into small uh, frequencies like bands of frequencies and then basically pen them individually and it would allow you if you actually take a lot of loudspeakers and give each one of them a certain frequency you know without doing any panning you take a sound shifting from up to down like this you know like a sweep and the sound will actually move through the speakers now, if you take more complex sounds, we started actually making, uh, 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 using movies as filters. Like for instance, a movie of the sea, uh, the sea, like uh, the seashore uh, on, on, uh, on, um, on the pink noise will actually uh, give you some movement through the speakers 
and give you actually an actual sound of the sea in a way, but in a way you've never heard before because it's not panning based on movement, like actual movement, like uh, amplitudes, but it's based on, on the, the uh, uh, frequential content. So, so uh, when it was performed for the 120 speakers with an audience, people uh, really said they experienced the sea like never before. But it was not the sea, it was pink noise. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they totally believed in it because it was actually getting uh, almost the same result. Uh, they, they thought it sounded like the sea. Or it yes, but it was just like being inside of it without really understanding what's happening. I imagine also, it would be. Yeah. Another Great. thing is if you uh, use uh, uh, even uh, like a. a, a Let's say each loudspeaker is playing a certain uh, frequency or a combination of frequencies. Depending on where you're sitting, you're hearing something completely different. So I played some stuff live like this. And then after a while, I told people, OK, now you're hearing some really nice blending of frequencies or things around you. And it's very nice. And you're getting used to it. Now, please stand up and walk around. And when you stand up and walk around, you actually hear everything blending. Suddenly, you're creating your own mix. It's getting way more complicated because each loudspeaker is playing something different because there is no sweet spot. No. The idea is, is always that, that uh, uh, we tend to think it should be centered upon us, but it doesn't have to be. We discussed that a bit uh, at some point also. What if we made movies in which in this, uh, in this big auditorium where we're watching movies, people, depending on where they're located, didn't get all the same informations? What kind of scenarios would we develop in that way? So you would hear someone talk to you to the left or whisper to your ear, but other people won't hear that. How would you actually develop film if that was the case? If actually sound could be a little bit more dependent on space, if the space was coming first and not instead of everyone having the exact same reproducible experience. Or a game, a VR game where you're all on different tracks, depending Absolutely. on the space that you're Absolutely. moving through. Uh, mm. I've played concerts for, for headphones as well. And it's very fascinating to think about you know, if you have an audience of 100 people listening to something, and what if one of them receives a different message or a different music or some message in the music or whatever it is that you're doing? And what if you didn't tell them that they're receiving yeah, You different... should absolutely not tell them. That. <laughs> Obviously, you should not. But what if you actually divided the room into several, you know, factions or whatever? Well, that's a bit of a simple thing. In the same way, you could record a party, uh, for instance, and say... Uh, I'm using, uh, let's say, 20 microphones and recording a party where there's a lot of small talk. And then you would actually record it and you would be able to move around and listen to the small talk and maybe decode the story after a while. You could make entirely new, or I don't know if it's new, but you could make completely interesting um, uh, dramaturges out of this principle. Because you could just go back to the same, play the same clip and listen to it again and again and again. And in a messy room, in this uh, ambience where everybody's talking at the same time, most people are a bit drunk, then you would hear someone talk about someone else and you start in identifying the people. Then you can you know, start building up a story about what's really happening in there. Who are they talking about? Uh, what is related to what? And, you know, and, and this would be uh, interesting in the, because you would basically be able to morph between all of it. You know? Listen to all of these people instead of recording them separately and then blending them into a predefined space with good acoustics, bad acoustics, well, depending on how you do it. Yeah, I'm imagining a, like a murder mystery. Yeah, event, yeah, that's a, that's a, or you have a, to figure out, <laughs> yeah. For instance. I'm trying to imagine, you know, certain applications of this rather than um, mm -hmm. just as a, an artwork. Yes. Yeah. Have you, have you worked with, um, kind of implementing any of this in like a theater production or like a um <clears throat> not not yet as such i'm working on it at the moment but there's no there um the the last theater production i worked on that's the shadow thing i was showing mm -hmm. uh, beforehand and it doesn't uh, it doesn't work like that it's already complicated enough to have an artificial intelligence generating its own uh, sound and voice and uh, story uh, in a multi-channel environment plus holographic uh, visuals. Uh, so <laughs> I, would, I would totally have loved to do exactly that, but, but uh, that was a bit more, uh, more complicated. But it was very interesting to go from something which is generated by an object and tells you about its mood, its movements, its, uh, its, uh, its uh, relationship to a person, an actress, uh, and then at some point switch to something which is more of a mood 
like you get into the memories of the actors and then suddenly you, the, the, uh, the role of the loudspeakers changes completely, you know, from describing someone to describing a place or describing a memory. And then you start blending them and it becomes really exciting, I would say. But uh, these things uh, uh, I, we were just discussing, I have actually uh, not been able to do it. And I was on track to do it, like the bedroom thing I was talking about, uh, but uh, even got some funding, a little bit of funding for that. Uh, but then came uh, COVID-19. <laughs> very, very bad timing for that. Uh, or doing the party thing, for instance. That yeah. was very, very uh, impossible. Suddenly, it was just like, ding, okay, I'm, I'm going to work on virtual stuff for a while. Yeah. And uh, forget <laughs> about the microphones and the lots of people doing stuff. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Um, I think we actually have to wrap it up now because we're running out of time. But yes. Thank you so much for, for sharing all of your projects. And if anyone out there would like to experience some of Jan's work, he will be um, joining us with a sound installation at yes. Danish Sound Day, which is on the 17th of November. Um, yeah, so hopefully we'll see some of you there. And do you have anything else to say, Jan, before we wrap it up? No, I, I would just like to thank, thank you for the invitation. I think it's, it's also... Uh, um, uh, even though it seems like I'm going into very different direction, but it's very exciting to hear the developments uh, from uh, Fino and Stefania as well. So that's very, is. very, uh, very much listening. It was yeah. Really so thanks. We've had the research and the industrial and the creative all yes. in one session. Thank you very much. And uh, we're going to send out our survey. So if you could spend one minute and fill it out, it would really help us to um, improve our work here in the cluster and we're going to send you all of the information from today so you can reach out to people and um, yeah stay tuned for our future events we have a, a lot coming up this year so I hope to see some of you there thanks guys bye thank you so much